Hello, everyone, and welcome to our um, ICD-10 coding update webinar. Um, we are very happy uh, to have you all join us today. Um, my name is Melinda Gabori, CEO and co-founder of Healthcare Provider Solutions, and I am joined today by Robbie James, our Director of Coding and Oasis Review, who will be um, speaking in the latter half of our webinar today. Um, if you have any um, difficulties with the webinar today, please put those in the chat box. If you have questions for Robbie and I to address, please put those in the Q&A box that you should find at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, we have a lot of information to cover today. Um, I'm going to begin with the coding implement implications. I'm going to get the word out in a minute implications to PDGM, um, as well as um, some very specific updates that um, we have seen in the proposed rule um, for the comorbidities and primary diagnosis reclassifications. We're also going to discuss um, some medical review implications um, of the diagnoses as related to the face-to-face -face encounter. Um, I'm then going to turn the webinar over um, to Robbie, who will be uh, going through with you um, some very specific ICD-10 changes that will go into effect October 1st, uh, keeping in mind that the proposed rule changes we talk about in the beginning go into effect January 1st, um, and then we will have some time left um, at the end of the presentation today to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I will have the Q&A box up um, and try to answer questions as they come through, but I will also coordinate questions at the end of our presentation today. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, we're going to start with this beautiful map of the PDGM HIPS code that I'm sure many of you have seen over and over and over again. Um, the key component of the PDGM model, as you can see as it relates to our webinar today especially, um, is the primary or principal diagnoses um, that is in the orange section on the screen um, and is specific to the primary diagnosis that is found on your claims. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. And then you have in the gray boxes toward the bottom of that chart, the comorbidity adjustment that is specific to the secondary diagnoses, again, that are specifically found on your claims. Um, and so as um, we go through, we're going to discuss some of those significant changes that are being proposed that will directly impact these PDGM calculations. So the PDGM uh, model, based on the primary diagnosis of the patient, will group your patient into a clinical grouping, one of the 12 that you see on the screen. Um, one thing that has not changed um, is that these 12 groupings remain exactly the way they are um, or were when we started PDGM. The only updates or changes to that are some of the codes within these classifications um, that have been updated last year and others that are being changed, updated, realigned, put into different groups. And there, in fact, are some that are being completely removed um, from this classification and from the comorbidity adjustments. And so when, when grouping your patients into these 12 groupings, again, it is based solely and completely on the primary diagnosis of the patient. Now, most of you know, I'm sure, that the primary diagnosis of the patient should be driven solely by the primary focus of care for the time period in which you're coding. And so when you're initially coding a brand new start of care for a patient or a recertification of a patient, um, you obviously are going to be coding the primary focus that is the intent for that 60-day episode. Um, and that, of course, is for the plan of care. 
and initially for the Start of Care Oasis, um, the Start of Care Oasis. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that you all have heard this yet, um, but in the proposed rule for uh, January of 2023, um, e implementation of Oasis E, um, there will be no diagnosis to even be put on a recertification OASIS. And so coding um, from an OASIS standpoint will not even exist when you recertify a patient. Um, but the um, obviously the plan of care and orders to take care of the patient in a recertification period still have to be coded. Um, and so this chart or table that you see on your screen is specific to the primary diagnosis categories that drive those 12 clinical groupings. And you see the groupings on the left that we just looked at. And on the right, you see the primary reason for the home health encounter if you use that primary diagnosis. So in other words, um, if your chart is medically reviewed, and you have used a primary diagnosis from the musculoskeletal rehab primary diagnosis category for grouping, um, it should be that your primary focus of care is PT, OT, or ST for a musculoskeletal condition. It should not be that your primary diagnosis is from the musculoskeletal rehab grouping and your primary focus of care is being conducted by skilled nursing. And so it is really important um, that your staff see this table, understand this table, and know that if and when they are coding based on those primary diagnosis of the patient, that the principal reason for the home health period should coincide to that primary diagnosis grouping. Hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> Let me know if you have any questions about that. Also, as we moved into the PDGM model, um, it became very prevalent to discuss um, what happens when a patient transitions um, into a subsequent 30-day payment period. Um, as you all know, um, when we developed that initial plan of care that is developed, as was always the case, to be a 60-day episodic care plan. However, under the PDGM model, we are paid based on 30-day uh, payment periods. And so the question becomes, if we start out with a primary diagnosis of <clears throat> a UTI, we'll just use that as an example, and by the end of the first 30-day period, the UTI has resolved, the question is, can we change the primary focus of care for the second 30-day period? And the answer is absolutely 100% yes. Um, the concern becomes, um, and the um, inconsistency of responses you will get <laughs> surrounds, do we have to have an order to change the primary focus of care in the second 30-day period? If we are moving, for example, the second diagnosis that was on the original plan of care to now be the primary diagnosis on the second 30-day period. Many think that you don't have to have a new order or don't have to have a signed order to change the second diagnosis to the primary diagnosis because you're just moving codes around. Um, but my concern is, and my recommendation has always been, um, that if you are changing the primary focus of care, you are changing the physician's order, and uh, in which case you need a signed order to do that. Um, so you are you want to make sure that you are um, looking at each thirty day period individually, um, so that if there is a change in the focus of care, that you are updating that. Um, and it definitely could impact your reimbursement. Um, so you're going to want to make sure you take a hard look at that. When we talk about the comorbidity adjustments as they relate to the PDGM model, the comorbidity adjustments include both a low comorbidity and a high comorbidity adjustment. 
With a low comorbidity adjustment, you only need one single diagnosis um, in your secondary diagnoses on your claim in order to get that low comorbidity adjustment, which equates to approximately a 5.08% increase in case mix weight. The high comorbidity adjustment is the combination of two separate diagnoses found in the secondary diagnoses of your claim, where in combination with each other, um, equal a high comorbidity adjustment. And I'm going to show you some examples of that in detail in just a few minutes um, to make sure we're clear about that. And that does result in a 9.6% additional increase in case mix weight when you recognize a high comorbidity adjustment. So going from having no comorbidity adjustment at all to now having a high comorbidity adjustment, you have added almost 15% to your case mix weight in the HIPS code for your patient's payment. Um, so you definitely want to, so, so the reality is, regardless of whether you understand how these comorbidity calculations work or how they don't work, the reality remains, as long as you are coding every diagnosis that the patient has to the greatest specificity possible, then what happens with these comorbidities is going to work itself out. The reality is you've got to support any coding um, that you do. Um, from physician medical record, um, but the reality is um, you, you need to focus on coding every condition the patient has to the greatest specificity possible, and this will all work itself out in the secondary diagnosis portion. So under the current 2022 PDGM regulation, um, there are um, 20 subgroups for low comorbidity adjustments. There have been proposed for 2023 to be 23 um, subgroups. For high comorbidity adjustment, there are currently today 87 subgroup interactions. And for 2023, they are proposing 94. So these are the current, this screen and the next, are the current categories for a low comorbidity adjustment. And in this screen, this is the activity that has been proposed for the 2023 implementation specific to those low comorbidity adjustments. The musculoskeletal one diagnoses and the respiratory nine diagnoses categories will be completely removed from the comorbidity, uh, low comorbidity calculation. Circulatory 2, gastro 1, neo 3, neuro 12, and respiratory 10 will all be added to the secondary uh, low comorbidity adjustment list. Um, so you'll want to make sure you get a copy of that detail list um, of exactly which codes are included, um, which can be found in the pricer. Now, we obviously are not going to go through every one of these um, in detail. Um, but the reality is um, these 87 I'm clicking through are the current today 87 comorbidity subgroups. So I'm going to go back one screen because this is what I want you to see. So one of the confusing factors about the high comorbidity adjustment is, okay, I have this neurological diagnosis and I have this, this particular heart diagnosis as secondary, why does the combination of that neurodiagnosis and that heart diagnosis not work? And so if you look at this screen, I've gone back a couple of screens. Um, this is the heart 11 combination with neuro seven. Everybody see that? So if you had a heart 11 diagnosis and a neuro seven diagnosis, then you would get a high comorbidity adjustment. But if you have a neurological 10 diagnosis, as you see on this screen, and a heart diagnosis, you see there's no combination there for neuro 10 and heart 1 diagnoses. So you have to make sure that the two diagnoses that you um, intend to get a high comorbidity adjustment for fit into the specific groupings 
that you see within the high comorbidity listings, um, or you're not going to get that high comorbidity adjustment. Um, in the PDF file that you would have been sent with the link to get into this Zoom meeting, um, in that PDF, you have not only the PowerPoint screens themselves, um, but you also have an attachment. So there's a few pages right after the PowerPoint that include the 2023 proposed groups that total those 94 subgroup interactions that they are proposing for next year. So I want to make sure um, that you get those, um, that copy, and that you uh, do have your hands on that um, to share and to look through um, and look at what is likely going to be finalized um, as the high comorbidity subgroups um, next year. Okay, um, there have been some reassignments um, to the comorbidity subgroups um, from what was today in 2022 to what will be um, in 2023. These technically are the ones that were regrouped in 2022. So currently today, there's a link here that you can get to those, but this is the table. And again, these are the ones that are current today that were finalized for implementation in 2022. Um, and that is um, that these are active today. Um, in this situation, they're just basically moving um, many of them anyway, all of the e-codes you see in the middle are being moved from one endocrine two or three group into um, some of them staying the same, but others being moved into neurological diagnosis categories. Um, and then you see all of those M codes, um, <clears throat> I, start, I should say, sorry, I codes um, that had no group at all that are now a heart nine diagnosis. And then at the very bottom, um, the musculoskeletal codes that were in no group remain in no group, and then some that were in musculoskeletal three, and those have remained the same as well. I'm not sure why they even put those on the table. Um, when we get into what's going to happen in 2023, this is a much bigger deal than what they did in 2022. They are proposing in 2023 to reassign 320 diagnosis codes to a different clinical group um, if they're listed as primary, and they're reassigning 37 diagnosis codes to a different comorbidity subgroup when listed as a secondary diagnosis. Um, in the attachment, the Table 1A attachment that this screen references, um, as far as the proposed rule is concerned, we have also attached that in the attachments with your handouts, so you have the full list of the 159 um, codes <clears throat> that are being reassigned um, from unspecified into a primary diagnosis grouping. Um, are being taken out of the diagnosis scraping. So they were unspecified codes that were listed in the primary diagnosis category as acceptable diagnosis under PDGM. And those 159 codes are being completely removed from the acceptable primary diagnosis list. Again, that attachment, which is table 1A, um, is in your attachments with the handout. So if you've been using any of those 159 diagnoses as a di primary diagnosis on your claims, you will not be allowed to use those after January 1. Your software systems obviously should update so that you're not able to use those codes as primary anymore. Um, we all hope that that happens, um, but if it, even if it does not happen, um, you will need to make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, you will need to make sure um, that that is happening because your claims um, will reject if the primary diagnosis um, is used, those 159 that they are removing. So in this case, um, on the screen, they are proposing to reassign the diagnosis that you see above B78.9 and N83.201, um, the first one is being assigned um, to uh, from the wound category uh, to now the clinical group K or MMTA infectious diseases. 
Um, and then we also have code N83.201 that is being moved from the MMTA other category to the clinical grouping J, which is MMTA gastrointestinal tract. Um, it's really, really important that you see some of these changes that are taking place because, for example, the B78.9 code, if you've used that as primary, you've been getting wound points for that. And now you would get MMTA infectious disease points for that, which is probably 10 to 15 percent less case mix weight than it was when it was in the wound care group. Um, so you really want to pay attention to all these changes that have taken place. Um, <clears throat> on this screen, we have um, a, a 144 gout-related ICD-10 codes um, that have been moved to the clinical group musculoskeletal rehab, where these gout-related codes did not have a clinical grouping previously. Um, and so these um, codes, again, completely non-existent um, in the grouping model before, now 144 are being added. That is attachment table 1B, which is also found in your attachments in addition uh, to the PowerPoint screens. Um, just above the gout-related documentation on the screen is the lymphedema codes. Um, these lymphedema codes um, are being moved um, from the, uh, the musculoskeletal rehab that they were in before um, and musculo or MMTA other. All of these, all three of these codes are now being moved to wound care, which is a huge deal um, if you have patients that have had these um, lymphedema codes in the past. Um, you were not getting wound care credit for those. Um, you will now uh, get wound care credit um, as we move into 2023. These diagnoses, which are all crushing injuries, are being moved from the clinical group A, which is MMTA other, to clinical group B, neurological rehab. These neurological rehab codes um, do know that there are only about a 3% difference in your case mix weight between neurological rehab and wound care or the wound codes. Um, so for them to be moved from MMTA other to neurological rehab is again a big deal um, and 10 plus percent increase um, in case mix weight. The next one is reassigning um, F60.5 from their current assignment in behavioral six to behavioral five, which is, um, and this is a secondary diagnosis situation. Um, so we, we need to look at the low and high comorbidity adjustments to see if this, that's going to be a big impact, uh, moving it from behavioral six to behavioral five. Um, Q82.0. Um, is um, being moved to circulatory 10 when listed as a diagnosis code, uh, as a secondary diagnosis, and it was not in a subgroup previously. Um, so it's being newly added as an acceptable secondary diagnosis into a grouping that would group um, low or high. These codes are malignant neoplasms first of the upper respiratory, which is reassigning all of those C30, 31, and 32 codes from neoplasm six to neoplasm one. And this is again, a secondary diagnosis change. So you would need to look at the impact and the low and high comorbidity adjustments according to um, it now being, them all now being neoplasm one diagnosis grouped. Then um, the neoplasm of unspecified adrenal gland is being reassigned C74 and 74.9 from not having a group at all to being now neoplasm 15 codes when listed as a secondary diagnosis for purposes of the comorbidity adjustment. Um, the next one um, is um, moving the supplemental codes to the new comorbidity subgroup Neuro 12, which is non-diabetic neuropathy. There are 18 diagnosis codes from table 1C um, that have been moved um, to be non-diabetic uh, non um, neuropathy. And I'm pretty sure we have that list on the next screen. 
Um, we also have um, proposed to change the description of the current comorbidity subgroup Neuro 11. It will no longer be called diabetic retinopathy and macular and macular edema. It will now be the disease of macula and blindness or low vision. So that's just a title change. A list of codes that did have no group whatsoever before, now going to be a neuro 12 and the group of polyneuropathies at the bottom, uh, moving from neurological 11 to now neurological 12. Um, and these are all uh, reassignments in secondary diagnoses categories. Comorbidity, uh, I said uh, in comorbidity diagnosis categories. Um, these are respiratory comorbidities, reassigning uh, J1812 from comorbidity subgroup respiratory four to now respiratory two. Um, again, these are all secondary groupings, reassigning J982 and J983 uh, from comorbidity subgroup respiratory nine to now respiratory four. And lastly, um, they are moving uh, U09.9 uh, post COVID-19 condition from subgroup respiratory two to respiratory 10, which is the 2019 novel coronavirus um, category. Um, and that's when it's listed as a secondary diagnosis. So what you need to hear about that is the respiratory 10 category was just added to the low comorbidity subgroups for 2023. And they are including in that grouping, in addition to the coronavirus code itself, this U09.9 uh, post COVID condition code um, into that sub, uh, secondary grouping. Okay, um, I want to talk to you about the face-to-face -face encounter and the relationship of coding to medical review. Um, and then I have a few questions about the things we've discussed so far in the queue before I turn um, the call over to Robbie. So the face-to-face -face encounter um, has been in our lives uh, tormenting us, <laughs> for lack of a better term, since 2011. Um, in 2015, um, the face-to-face -face encounter was revised. The instructions for the face-to-face -face encounter were revised, which now include that the face-to-face -face encounter, you must have an actual encounter note from the practitioner that has conducted the face-to-face -face encounter. You can no longer use the old dead form. So if you're still using that old dead form, you need to stop. Um, there are many agencies that are using or, or getting the actual encounter note from the practitioner. And in addition to that, still forcing someone to sign this additional face-to-face -face form because your computer system's spitting it out, but it is completely worthless. So you need to stop using it. But for terms of discussion of the face-to-face -face encounter today, um, we need to talk about the primary diagnosis situation. And so when we are looking at a medical review situation, or even if we're in a review choice demonstration state, um, which is currently active in five states, and you're having to get an affirmation of your patient's um, medical record prior to being able to bill your 30-day claims, you are having to send a signed plan of care, face-to-face -face encounter, et cetera, so that they can validate the original certification of the patient. And a part of that certification of the patient initially um, is to ensure that the agency has a valid face-to-face -face encounter and that the primary diagnosis listed on the care plan has been treated during the face-to-face -face encounter. Now, this has evolved over time. There is absolutely no question about it. Um, it was not scrutinized this detail um, when, even when we got this information in 2015, it just wasn't. Um, but medical review has continued to evolve um, over the last 
um, few years. And as we've gotten into this affirmation process with pre-claim review under the review choice demonstration, and we have um, began to deal with the third party review contractors pulling things out of their hat seemingly, and that's the honest truth. We're now at a situation where you're not gonna get paid if the chart is medically reviewed and you're not gonna get an affirmation under PCR if the primary diagnosis on your care plan is not treated during the face-to-face -face encounter. So exactly what does that mean? That means that the diagnosis, let's say it's diabetes. Let's say your primary diagnosis for home care is diabetes. If you have a face-to-face -face encounter note from a physician that has a list of diagnosis for the patient that includes the diabetic code you're going to use as primary, many have believed that that was enough. The answer is that is not enough. There has to be some kind of treatment, order, medication change, something that the physician has documented that they have assessed and treated that diagnosis in that encounter note in order for it to be considered a valid face-to-face -face encounter and for your patient's home health certification to be reality. So without that piece of the puzzle, you are not going to pass medical review and you're not going to get affirmations um, through the PCR process. And so for, for years, the number one denial in home health medical review was the face-to-face -face encounter. But back then, it was because the physician didn't sign it or the agency failed to include it in their medical review uh, or whatever the case might have been. And, and now that agencies have begun to get that part right, they, they've come up with something else, which again now includes that this primary focus of care situation has to be dealt with. And so in order for you to, to know that this is, is happening, your coders should not be coding the chart until the face-to-face -face encounter is present in the medical record. And so on behalf of your coders, if you're forcing them to code um, upon the return of the, the assessment from the clinician, et cetera, but a face-to-face -face encounter has not been obtained, how can you blame the coder for not ensuring that it is it is correct or accurate. Um, you can't is the answer. Um, so you want to make sure absolutely positively for sure that your face-to-face -face encounter is present in the chart prior to you requesting that chart be coded uh, by your coding staff or by your coding team, regardless of whether that's internal or outsourced. Um, that face-to-face -face encounter must be there. One other thing about face-to-face, -face, this is not technically um, a part of coding, but I want to make sure that it's that's heard and understood. In order for that face-to-face -face encounter to be valid, um, in order for you to be able to use it for coding, so technically it is wrapped in, right? Um, it has to be an actual encounter note where it is obvious that the practitioner signing it has seen and treated the patient. That document must be signed and dated. It must be within 60 days prior to the start of care, uh, within 90 days prior to the start of care, or within 30 days after the start of care. Uh, it must contain um, that information, the diagnosis information that you're going to be using as primary. In addition to certifying physician, the physician signing your plan of care must certify the date that the face-to-face -face encounter actually occurred. And you want to make sure that an appropriate practitioner has seen the patient and documented this encounter. And so what is an appropriate, acceptable practitioner to see the patient for the face-to-face -face encounter? The answer is any facility that the patient has been in who is directly referring the patient to home health, then you would have, <clears throat> excuse me, you would have an acceptable face-to-face -face encounter. If the patient has not been in a facility 
um, that directly refers the patient to home health, then you would need a community face-to-face -face encounter. The community face-to-face -face encounter must be completed by, if an MD is signing your care plan, it would need to be completed by that MD or a nurse practitioner working under that MD or with that MD. If a non-physician practitioner is allowed in your state to sign home health orders and certify patients, then that specific non-physician practitioner that's going to sign your care plan must be the one to conduct the face-to-face -face encounter. Again, that is only if the face-to-face -face encounter is a community encounter. Even if the nurse practitioner is signing your care plan, the patient's face-to-face -face encounter can come from a facility in which the patient had an admission and the facility directly referred the patient to home health. Um, so I just wanna make sure we're clear about that. Okay, we have a few questions um, in the queue from the things I've been discussing. So I'm gonna go ahead and answer those and I'm gonna start with the face-to-face -face encounter ones. Um, let's see, how do we address hospitals that still use the form certifying need for home health services? Our local hospital uses this form for all referrals and basically says the same thing for every referral. Um, the answer is, if it is not a document that outlines an actual encounter with a patient um, where it's evident that there was a face-to-face -face encounter with the patient and that is not separately signed and dated by the practitioner that um, provided the care to the patient, um, then you would not be allowed to use it as the face-to-face -face encounter for the patient. Regarding the face-to-face -face encounter, um, in the encounter assessed and treated or can just be assessed um, if it is clear. Um, again, there must be documentation to support that the physician has addressed, is technically the exact term, um, addressed that specific diagnosis. So if he mentions the diagnosis, makes any updates to the plan of the patient, et cetera, um, then it would count. Um, when, when you say the term assessed, that to me is a little loose. Um, so I think it would depend on the documentation piece by piece to know for sure. Um, how do you get the doctors to understand face-to-face -face encounter is done right? Um, well, the, the reality is you need a face-to-face -face encounter um, that has been documented that the patient has been seen uh, by the physician that they have treated what the primary diagnosis is going to be for home health. If you do not have that, then they are simply going to have to have an encounter performed um, that does meet that requirement. Um, it is difficult, I get it, um, to get them to understand what has to happen, um, but we simply have to keep pushing forward in hopes um, that they get it. Um, the reality is it's got to read like an actual visit note where the physician or practitioner has had an encounter with that patient and hey, they have treated the primary diagnosis um, that you're going to use for home health. When the face-to-face -face was done, wound was the primary diagnosis, the wound healed, but continued to see the patient for B12 injections and primary diagnosis was changed on the next research period. How does this affect RCD? So the review choice demonstration, if you're under pre-claim review, um, you have to submit that for every 30-day period um, that you are going to bill for. So when you change um, the primary diagnosis at recertification, your recertification plan of care um, will now include the new primary diagnosis. And the only time that they should be tying the primary diagnosis on your care plan to the face-to-face -face encounter is at the start of care. If the encounter note shows the encounter date and the physician signs the note, but does not date his signature, is that valid? Does the physician need to date his signature in addition to the encounter date being listed? So there's a lot of controversy over that very question. Um, the um, medical reviewers under pre-claim review in the review choice demonstration states have been allowing 
um, face to face encounters that have been signed, but not necessarily dated. I think that is very dangerous ground to be walking on because we have seen denials under medical review by third party contractors that have denied it without a signature. So I would suggest strongly a signature be there. I mean, a date be with the signature. We're getting pre-claim review denials because the face-to-face -face from the hospital and the plan of care is by the PCP. That should not be a denial. You need to fight that denial. If I understand correctly, you're saying that if you have a face-to-face -face from the hospital, but your plan of care is signed by the PCP, they're denying it because the appropriate practitioner did not do the face-to-face, -face, that is absolutely crazy. Um, and you definitely need to appeal it and uh, keep going up the ladder until they listen because that absolutely can't happen. Okay, um, let's see. Skilled nursing facility documentation shows that the physician created the signature and date instead of electronically signing it. Palmetto is telling me that I need a policy to accept the signature. How should we handle this? Hmm. Um, I, would, I would need to look at um, an example of what you mean. If you're saying that, it's, when you say that the physician created the signature and date, if that's an acknowledgement in an electronic medical record, then they need the electronic medical record policy from the facility showing that only the physician has access to do that. I'm pretty sure that's what they're asking for. If a patient was hospitalized then went to rehab, can you use the hospital encounter note as the face-to-face -face, or does it have to be from the rehab as they are the ones directly referring the patient to home health? You just answered your own question. Um, if the patient's in a hospital first and then goes to a SNP or rehab, you would have to accept the face-to-face -face encounter from the rehab facility, not the hospital. Um, I am hearing through the grapevine that there are um, face-to-face is being accepted um, from the second, I mean, from the hospital when the SNF um, is, the ho is the facility directly referring to home care um, under pre-claim review. However, under detailed medical review by third-party contractors, they will not allow it. And the regulation is very clear. It must be from a facility in which the patient is directly referred to home health. If a patient has a hospital stay, does the SNF where orders are given for discharge to home health, can the hospital note be used if the hospital stay was for the reason home health was ordered? If a patient has a hospital stay, does this goes to the SNF note, my same answer is the same. It must come from the SNF if they're in the SNF prior to being referred to home health. If the patient was treated and referred to home health by the hospitalist who would not continue to see the patient in the community, can you still use it as the face-to-face -face and have the PCP sign the plan of care? Absolutely, 100%, no questions asked. We use a face-to-face -face form to summarize the disciplines ordered and homebound status along with the primary diagnosis and date, but then add the face-to-face -face documentation from the doctor, e-signed by the doctor, is this acceptable? So you have to have the complete standalone encounter note signed and dated by the physician, period. If you are using an additional form to include additional clinical findings that you have um, developed after assessing the patient to support homebound status and clinical need, which you absolutely can do, um, then yes, having the PCP sign and date it, whoever is certifying the physician sign and date it, that would be acceptable. Um, however, you're making yourself go through a lot of work that you really don't need to do. 99% uh, of agencies are putting that additional supplemental documentation to support homebound status and medical necessity on the plan of care itself um, and the Medicare Max actually prefer that. Um, will It will be acceptable for the face-to-face -face encounter from the physician from the hospital, but PCP will sign the plan of care and the certification statement with the encounter date from the hospital. Yes, absolutely. 
Um, you definitely can have a hospital face-to-face -face and a PCP sign the point of care. If the OASIS -E is not going to require the codes on the follow-up, how will we be go changing the codes on the recertification period for billing? So I made the statement earlier that with OASIS E implementation January 1st, there will be no diagnosis coding M items on the OASIS document itself. And so you're going to need to discuss with your software vendor exactly how the diagnosis will now be pulled to your care plan. The diagnosis on the OASIS only holds six, the category on the OASIS only holds six diagnoses. And so those six diagnoses are not adequate for many patients. You should be coding way more than that anyway. Um, so the answer to be short is, is basically, you're going to have to get um, with your software vendor and determine where the coding will go in a research situation so it will adequately pull to the claim. The diagnoses on your claim today should not be pulling from the OASIS. It should be pulling from your care plan. The encounter note, uh, physician sends the referral that says the skilled nursing evaluation and treat um, hypertension. The encounter note shows the patient also needs wound care. The wound care would be primary since we're seeing them three times a week. It is addressed in the note for home health to perform wound care but it worries me about the eval and treat for hypertension. The order doesn't matter. Um, what the referral, what the referral says, um, the patient is being referred to home care for doesn't matter. Um, when you go out and assess the patient, whatever you determine with the physician that is going to certify the patient to be the primary focus of the home health episode is what should be primary, and that must tie to what was treated in the actual face-to-face -face encounter note. Okay, um, we're gonna take a break from uh, Q&A and we are going to get through the remaining uh, portion of our webinar today. And I'm going to hand the controls over to Robbie uh, so she can do that. Robbie, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. <laughs> no, sorry. Thank you, Melinda. I was getting uh, the controls, the screen controls going, and I think I've got that. Thank you for that great information on our changes that are coming with value-based purchasing and PDGM, and um, I guess not changes with the face-to-face, -face, but so much ongoing stuff and so many places where we're seeing CMS really focus in on things that we haven't seen them focus in on before. So now I want to shift a little bit and talk about our October 1 changes that are coming this year for our ICD-10 code SIP. And a lot of you have probably seen article headlines or had emails come across your desk that talk about the staggering number of coding changes this year. And that includes the 1176 new codes, the 200 plus tabular and alpha index changes, 28 revised codes, 287 invalidated codes, as well as some new guidelines for existing codes and the new codes and, and the expanded code sets. And when we think about all of these coding changes and we kind of put that through our past experience of what October 1st code changes have historically done with our claims, it can be a little intimidating. Last year, we didn't have nearly as many coding changes um, on October 1st, as we're going to have this year. I'm so sorry, I can't. My backup is not working. Melinda, can you help me? You may have to give me control back. Okay, I got it. Okay, sorry. You're fine. Just tell me when you need to change the screens. Uh, okay. Okay, so when we dive in a bit, for most of us, of all of those coding changes we just talked about, 
only about 33 are really going to affect us in terms of what may and may not cause our claims to reject. So for most of our home care Medicare certified agencies, just this set of 33 codes are what may cause us some problems on our claims. And then for those agencies that care for perinatal patients, we have another three codes that will affect some of our perinatal claims. The biggest group, the biggest category of our coding changes on October 1st are going to be to the V20 external cause codes. And there are hundreds that will fall under this V20 category because of all the subcategories. And then remember, when we think about our external causes, each external cause has that option for A, S, D. So it ends up being this huge number of codes, but they're all V20. And what V20 is, is a patient who has had an injury that was associated with a motorcycle or motorized bicycle accident. So let's think of our patient census and all of the patients that we've seen come across our desk in the last month, two months, six months, how many of those patients actually came to us or, or had in their medical history a motorcycle or motorized bicycle accident? That's gonna be very, very few for most of us. So all in all, if you take out those V20 codes and just think of your, your diagnosis codes, your medical diagnoses and your perinatal diagnoses codes, 36 is a lot easier to wrap our brains around and a lot less intimidating than over 1500 coding changes that are being you know, broadcast um, in everything that we read. Okay, Melinda, you can change the screen. So digging in a little bit deeper into those 36 codes, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the codes that we're probably going to see more often and what's going to affect us more often. And then kind of go down to the codes that aren't going to affect us as often, things that we're not going to see as home health, in home health as much. So first is acidosis. Um, and acidosis, like most of these code sets, what is happening is they're expanding the code set. So previously, maybe it was a four character code and now it's gonna be a five or more character code. Um, maybe it was a five character code and now they're expanding that code set to six or seven characters. When we think back to when we first began to talk about ICD-10, that was one of the things that we were told was that there, there were these holes and not every code is gonna go all the way out to seven characters with every single, single numer numerical and alphabetical um, possibility because they've left room for the code set to be expanded. So when we see a need, we can expand the code set and there's room for that. So that's what ha is happening with a lot of these codes for our October 1st, 2022 changes. So we're going to see acidosis quite a bit in our home health population. Probably the codes that we're going to see the most that are changing are our three different dementia codes. And it's going to be any one of those three dementia codes with the behavioral disturbance. So we've got our vascular dementia, our unspecified dementia, and our dementia due to other diseases. And in each of those then, when we have the dementia with a behavioral disturbance, the code set is expanding so that we can now further specify what those behavioral disturbances are. Next are the post-viral and related fatigue syndromes. We are seeing those more and more with our post-COVID conditions and our long COVID conditions. And I think that's why they've expanded that category. Another great thing is that they have also now, we have a, an actual code for chronic fatigue syndrome. And in the past, we haven't had that. We've had this R symptom code that didn't really recognize chronic fatigue syndrome as being a real thing with its own etiology. But we do now have that in that expanded G93. Okay, Melinda, can you go to the next slide? Less frequently, we will see aortic aneurysms and dissections and endometriosis. And there are a lot of code sets under those two categories, but the changes are very similar when you look through each set. And again, these are, these are conditions that in our home health population, we don't see a, a lot. We'll see them regularly, but not as much as, as the ones on the previous slide. Okay, next slide. Non-compliance with medical and treatment regimen. 
this is a code set that is expanding and I want to stop for just a minute because a few of you are going to say well I thought in home health we could never ever ever say non-compliance or code non-compliance so and stop quickly and just dispel that myth yes you can code non-compliance like any other code except those that our guidance specifically says the physician doesn't have to state this but for all other codes including non-compliance we can't determine that the patient has been non-compliance we can't make that clinical judgment the physician has to state that there's been non-compliance and for us to further specify causes of the non-compliance or the type of non-compliance that has to be in the physician's diagnostic statements so we can't just decide this patient is non-compliant the physician has to state it when the physician has to state non-compliance we can code it and it's not necessarily going to throw up any huge red flags patients can be non-compliant for a lot of reasons and there's a lot that home health nurses and therapists and social workers can do about that non-compliance so a, a non-compliance code when it's been diagnosed by the physician it can be coded and then it's what are you doing about that non-compliance how are you working to help that patient be more compliant and is the patient responding? So it's not an issue of we can't code this, we can code it and it doesn't throw up red flags. Where the red flags come in is when you've got this pattern with a patient of willful non-compliance and then it becomes a regulatory issue, more about like skilled need and medical necessity. So that code set is expanding and it's expanding also to include when we have a patient whose caregiver is non-compliant. So in those patients who really don't control for, for whatever reason, dementia or other mental health reasons or, or physical incapacities that they are not able to take care of themselves, we now have a caregiver non-compliance that we can code that says, hey, we have a caregiver here who is not being compliant. Pericardial cardio effusion and other non-rheumatic valve disorders, those code sets are also expanding. Now, only other non-rheumatic mitral valve disorders, that is not your specific non-rheumatic mitral valve um, issues that we typically see. So this is whenever it's like, it is an other category. So this is not stenosis. This is not prolapse. This is when it's something other than stenosis or prolapse, which are what we see most frequently. frequently. F43.8, other reactions to severe stress. Again, this is just those other reactions. So your codes for your PTSD are staying the same and any of the other F43 categories other than your, your other things that don't fall into those more specific categories. I47.2, ventricular tachycardia is expanding and N14.1, neuropathy due to drugs, medicine, medicines and other biological substances. Next slide. Less frequently, we will see some of these congenital and hemolytic diseases whose code sets are expanding and short stature due to endocrine disorder, something that we don't see very often at all in home health. Um, but if you do see it, there are a new expanded code set. Next slide. We talked about the external cause codes and just reinforcing here that the only changes, and this is the biggest group of changes, are all related to patients who have an injury that was related to a motorcycle or motorized bicycle accident. And again, that's going to be a very small subset of our patient population. Next slide. Our maternal or our perinatal codes that are that are changing are our maternal care for suspected central nervous system malformation in the fetus and other respiratory conditions originating in the perinatal period. Um, and then a historical code, a Z code, for personal history of certain corrected conditions arising in the perinatal period. So not a lot there. Again, it's only gonna apply if you have perinatal cases and if those perinatal patients have these specific codes. So not gonna affect a lot of our patients. So now we've kind of talked about what changes are happening and, and the subset that are going to affect, what can we do about billing issues and how are we going to address those? The main thing is to think about it up front before October 1st hits and find out how your software vendor handles that. 
So what happens to those of us on this call who are coders or who do outsource coding is a lot of times we'll get these messages that say, hey, this, this claim rejected, can you please change the code? And the answer is no, we can't. And the reason why is because the way that we access as coders, as your QA team, typically access coding is through, it's associated with an OASIS event. It's kind of like what Melinda was talking about to some extent with how the, the software vendors and the EMRs are going to handle the research no longer requiring coding. Well, this is kind of that same thing. It's, it's going to be in your EMR. How is that code going to get changed? And for the average coder working in an EMR, if there is no OASIS event, there is no way for us to change the code. The coding change has to be made on the claim. And one of the questions that we get quite frequently, well, if you need to change this code, then do we need to do a skick? No, no, you don't need to do a skick. Um, we, can, we can update the codes without doing a skick. That the patients remember a, a skick or another follow-up is a, a significant change in clinical condition. Nothing about this patient's clinical condition has changed. The diagnosis that the physician said the patient has on September 29th is the same diagnosis that the physician says the patient has on October 2nd. All that is changing is our representation of that diagnosis through the code set. So we don't need a skick, we don't need an order. Next. So what you wanna do is you want to make sure that your billing team is reaching out to your clinical or coding team and that the clinical or coding team gets back to the biller with the appropriate updated code once they've gone through the medical record to see what specificity is there. And that you then have a process that the billing team knows how to change that code. You also wanna make sure that your coding team and your coders know if they can or cannot access a way in your EMR to change that code. And most of the time, the answer is going to be no, it's gonna to need to go through the claim and through your billing system. But if there is a way for the coder to access it, and to change it, you need to let the coder know that. One of the other questions that I get quite frequently is, should we just omit codes that are going to be changing as of October 1st? Should we just leave those codes off? And the answer is no. Melinda mentioned this earlier, and I will reiterate. The conditions of participation say that we are to code all known active diagnoses. And going beyond that, the OASIS, the coding clinic, and PDGM guidance say to code all diagnoses that impact the plan of care. Thinking about the codes that are changing on October 1st, the first one that comes into my mind is dementia. Well, dementia is highly relevant to a patient's plan of care, correct? A lot of what we do in home health is teaching, is education, is safety. And a patient with dementia is always going to have, the dementia itself is a barrier to how we progress with that plan of care. So it's always gonna be relevant, plus it's active. So it's always going to need to be coded. Another one that's changing is that post-viral fatigue syndrome. How many patients do we see now that come to us with post-COVID fatigue syndrome? Well, you can't just take the fatigue syndrome out of that, correct? You can't even po code, um, the post-COVID syndrome, it's a secondary code. You have to have something in the primary. So it's not appropriate to just omit those codes, ignore those codes, pretend like the patient doesn't have those diagnoses. You have to code it, and then you have to determine a process for how you are going to work with the codes and update the codes as needed for your episodes that begin before October 1st and end somewhere after October 1st. Next slide. Some of the other interesting changes that we're, we're seeing, um, some of them are really good. Um, some of us coders are gonna applaud when we see some of them. They're things that we have been asking the coding clinic about, things that we've been asking for. And so it's really great to see some of these changes. We've had a change to G31.84. They've changed the verbiage and they've also added a related code F06.7. So prior to October 1st, we have mild cognitive impairment so stated, and it doesn't matter what the etiology is. If the doctor says that the patient has mild cognitive impairment, we're going to code G3184. But after October 1st, G3184 will now be mild cognitive impairment of uncertain or unknown etiology. So this is mild cognitive impairment. 
and we don't know what's causing it. Our new code, FO6.6, is mild neurocognitive disorder due to a known physiological condition. So in other words, we have mild cognitive impairment or mild neurocognitive disorder, and the doctor has stated that, and the doctor has also stated that it is due to XYZ diagnoses. And of course, FO6 is going to be one of those codes that, codes that cannot be used in the primary because it has to be coded after the etiology. So whatever's causing that mild neurocognitive disorder will get coded first and then the FO6.7 code. Another similar change that they made was dementia um, has been changed in a lot of the verbiage to read neurocognitive dis disorder. So other frontotemporal dementia is now other frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder. Dementia with Lewy bodies is now neurocognitive disorder with Lewy bodies. Next. This change is a little more confusing. And, and I say that because a lot of us have been confused already about the difference in our substance use, abuse, and dependence and the guidelines that drive those and what we can and can't do and what we can and can't presume. And I don't think we have had a quarterly coding clinic in the last two years that have not addressed substance use abuse dependence in at least two to three questions. So what we have now um, that will happen on October 1st, the new guidelines will give us use in remission so use, this has nothing to do with abuse, this has nothing to do with dependence, but our use codes will now have a use in remission code. And then specifically alcohol use is now getting a use unspecified, uncomplicated code. But we won't use this code. I'm not going to use that use unspecified uncomplicated code, which was previously we use Z7289. Now that code would be F1090. But the reason why we're not going to use this code is because our guidelines tell us that we can only code substance use when there is an associated substance related disorder. And then our guidelines go on to tell us that those disorders are psychological, sleep disorders, mental and behavioral, basically anything that would code to our chapter five in our coding book, which are our F codes. If we don't have an F code diagnosis that goes along with substance use, then we cannot code the use by itself, even if the doctor states it. So the example I tend to give is if the doctor say, says that I use wine every day, one glass of red wine a day, that is alcohol use, but we can't code that because he has not stated a related disorder. If the doctor says Robbie uses wine every day and she has hallucinations one hour later, now we have those hallucinations, which will code to an F code, and they are related to my alcohol use. And the doctor also has to make the link there. So another thing that has been recent guidance from the coding clinic is we cannot use with and in guidelines to make presumed relationships about alcohol or I'm sorry about substance use abuse and dependence. So the specific guideline that was sent to the coding clinic was if the patient has alcohol abuse and anxiety, can we code that as alcohol use with anxiety and, and link those two together? And the answer was no. So my doctor would have to say, Robbie drinks wine and her wine drinking causes her to hallucinate. If my doctor just says there is wine drinking and there is hallucination, we can't code that together. We wouldn't code the use at all. So again, we have this new code for alcohol use, unspecified, uncomplicated, but we can't really use it due to other guidelines. Next slide. And um, you can actually go one more past this because we talked about this. The next addition to our coding list is a code for POTS. Hallelujah. How many times have we um, each sent questions to the coding clinic, I think, and then they, they finally, they addressed it in a quarterly. 
um, and how we were going to code that. And they had said for us to code it as I-49.8, which was other specified cardiac arrhythmias. But now we do have this nice code for POTS that is specifically for, for POTS. It's not kind of a generic other, um, like the I-49.8. And this is going to include chronic orthostatic intolerance as well as postural tachycardia syndrome. Talked about G93.3, post-viral and related fatigue syndromes. Use additional code if applicable for post-COVID-19 condition, unspecified U09.9. We talked about that U09.9 is a secondary code. So G93.3 is one of the codes that can be coded um, before that to make you so that you have a vi valid primary diagnosis. G93.31 is post-viral fatigue syndrome. G93.32 is mild myalgic encephalomyelitis, and also the code that's going to be used now for chronic fatigue syndrome. Hooray, hooray. That's no longer in our code. We see it diagnosed a lot in our patient population, and up until now it was in our code, so it was it would cause us a lot of problems. So now we have this G93 code that is specific to chronic fatigue syndrome. G9339, other post-infection and related syn fatigue syndromes, and G93.4, other and unspecified encephalopathy. And then, of course, we have an excludes note for that that excludes alcoholic encephalopathy, which has its own code. Next. After October 1st, we will have code specific for refractory angina pectoris. So prior to October 1st, we had to use other, whether it be other, um, other angina when it's just the refractory angina or CAD with other angina when it was CAD and we had the refractory. Now we have specific codes. They've expanded those code sets so that refractory angina has its own code in both of those by itself and with coronary artery diseases. Another big... Hooray, hooray, that we've asked the coding clinic about, ANCA vasculitis. The coding clinic had previously answered us to use I-77-89, other specified disorders, but now ANC vasculitis has its own code, I-77-82. So um, we are seeing that diagnosed more and more. I'm unsure why, if it's just that more physicians are aware of it and are, are diagnosis, diagnosing it and further specifying it. Um, or if there is some sort of trend in our in health care and in, in our health condition that it is occurring more. But whatever the case, we're seeing it diagnosed more and more, and now we have a code for it. J9587 is being added for transfusion-associated dyspnea. Before, we had to use an other, other post-procedural complications of the respiratory system, so kind of one of those generic other categories. Now we have something specific. K76.82 is being added for hepatic encephalopathy. I know a lot of us are happy to see this code added. Before, we had to use K72.9 for hepatic failure, and that just didn't always seem to fit and, and really describe the patient and what was going on. It was one of those, we are doing it because the code book says to do it, but, but we just don't feel comfortable when, when the doctor doesn't say failure, he says encephalopathy, and then it codes to failure. And we even had some doctors sometimes that would come back and say, I, I didn't say this patient was in hepatic failure. And, you know, having to explain to the doctors, well, you said encephalopathy, and encephalopathy codes to failure. So now we have um, hepatic encephalopathy has its own code. Fournier's great gangrene for women. Another big one that we've had that we've had to have the coding clinic um, clarify for us because Fournier's gangrene, the N49.3 code, is for males only. And so even if the doctor diagnosed a female patient with Fournier's, that specific code set is under male genitalia. And if you put it on a female patient's um, claim, it would RTP, you'd have a problem. And so we'd asked the coding clinic, they had told us to use N7689, we'll continue to do that until October 1st, when we'll get a new code for women for foreigners, and that is set N7682. I am missing a bullet point there, the, the point itself for SO6.6 for intracranial injury. Um, so right now, our default code tells us that, um, 
when we have a patient with an intracranial injury, um, we don't know if the person lost, and we don't know if the person lost consciousness or not. As of right now, we have to say, yes, the person lost consciousness, but we don't know for how long. And we do that by using the six character of nine. What's going to happen October 1st is we're going to get a new six character A. And what it's going to say is we don't know if they did or didn't lose consciousness. So right now we don't have a way to say that. If we don't know whether or not they lost consciousness, then we default to they did, but we don't know for how long. But once October 1st comes around, we will have a code that A six character that we can say yes, or we don't know if they lost consciousness or not. It's not documented. So we're going to use the six character of A. T4365, poisoning by adverse effect of underdosing of methamphetamines. So previously we had um, amphetamines and our, we would use that category, the 62.62 category for methamphetamines and amphetamines. And now methamphetamines have their own category. This is one that I think everyone will be excited about, Z7985. Z we now have a code for non-insulin injectable antidiabetics. For the last couple of years, we've been using Z79.899 for those. Um, they've been around for a while, but really how many have we seen in probably the last five to seven years? There's a lot more of them. They're being used a lot more often. So I think it's great that we now have a specific code for Z7985. Another question that I get asked quite a bit is that um, when we go to our diabetic codes, our E11s and E10s, and well, I guess this wouldn't so much be for E10 because we don't necessarily use these with, with type one diabetes, but our E11s and our E13s, some of those, um, there's not a use additional code for the non-insulin anti-diabetics. The use additional code in the tabular instructions only, a, only says insulin and oral anti-diabetics. So do we have to use the Z7985 um, non-insulin anti-diabetic drugs? And my answer would be, my interpretation of the guidelines is that yes, we do, even though it's not there in that use additional code in the tabular instructions, if we go to our coding guidelines, there are very specific guidelines and it says to use the non-insulin injectables code if it applies to the patient. So that's my interpretation of that guideline is that yes, we do have to code this. It is a, a have to situation. The next one is um, long-term use of immunodilators and immunosuppressants, Z79.6. And we've got a couple of different more specific categories for those. We talked earlier about our new codes for the caregiver non-compliance with the patient's medical treatment treatment re regimen that we didn't have a way to capture previously. We've got some new codes for a slipped upper femoral epiphysis, non-traumatic, and they, well, they not new codes, but I'm sorry, they've taken that code set. And before we had the options for acute chronic, acute on chronic, and right, left, and unspecified. So they've added to that choices for stable and unstable, and now we also have a choice for bilateral. If we had this condition before and it happened on the right side and the left side, we had to do use two different codes. Now we can use one single code for the bilateral. Next. Um, we have a new M96 code for the fracture of the ribs, sternum and thorax associated with compression of the chest for CPR. And we see this regularly, not, not often, but, but at least a few times a year, I think, typically in our, our females um, or very elderly, where there has been some chest compression and ribs, sternum, or thorax, something has been broken. This does include the fracture of the xiphoid process. And they have added a specific code for this, um, whereas before we had to use one of those other complications, other post-procedural complications, along with our Y84 code for other medical procedures as the cause of the abnormal reaction. So now we can, instead of using the two codes, we can use just the one, our M96A codes. Next. 
they broke that down into several different sections and to more specifically say what has been broken so it's several different categories in M96A. Next. We have new code for lumbar and lumbosacral fibrous disc defects. This is not something that we see that level of specificity very often in our physician documentation, if we do have it and the patient also has a lumbar disc herniation, we would code that first. Muscle wasting and atrophy. This is one that we see fairly frequency and frequently. And what they did was they added um, the A character for the back. Before this, we didn't have anything to specify muscle wasting and atrophy of the back. We would use the other muscle wasting and atrophy. Now we have the dot five A which include, which is the category for the back. <coughs> Excuse me. Updates to external cause codes include W23.2, which is caught, crushed, or jammed, or pinched between a moving and stationary object. So prior to October 1st, we have, you can either be caught between two moving objects, or you can be caught between two stationary objects, and if you're caught between a moving object and a stationary object, it defaults to moving object. After October 1st, with our new codes, we will actually be able to state that someone was caught between a moving object and a stationary object. And then finally, D7584, other platelet activating anti-PF4 PF4 disorders. It has its own very specific category now. We don't have to use the D75 other category. Um, this is not one that we see very often, but it is one that often enough that we now have a specific code set for that. Next. So that wraps up all of our changes, all of our code set changes, all of our regulation changes. Does anyone have any other questions? So Robbie, this is Melinda. Um, I have been answering questions like crazy the entire time you've been talking um, by uh, typing in the responses. So we want to thank you all for all of your fabulous questions. We do have a couple I want to address regarding the changing the diagnosis at the 30 day point for the subsequent 30 day periods. And then there are a few very detailed coding questions that I have copied from the queue that Robbie um, will put together the responses for, and we will get those back to you um, in the form of an email to all of the ones um, that have participated today. Um, so don't worry, um, you will get um, your responses. Also know that this is being recorded and it will be um, posted on our website for public access. Also note that in the chat box, um, we have given you a link um, where you can, uh, it would be the post in the chat was from Robbie and it will give you, it gives you a link um, to be able to schedule a call to discuss any coding um, issues, services, et cetera, with Robbie, um, if you would like to do that. So the last two questions I'm going to respond to, and then we're going to let you um, let you go and wind up our call today. Um, if the face-to-face -face is performed within 30 days after the start of care, is it okay to backdate codes to activate at time of start of care? So when when you say that, um, if if a if a face-to-face -face encounter happens on day 15 of your a 30-day period, um, I would hope that the diagnosis that winds up being the primary reason for home care existed at the start of care. Um, it just had not been addressed in a face-to-face -face encounter, and thus we're now addressing it in the face-to-face -face encounter. One person had already asked, and I already responded to that um, by typing in the response, the question that they asked was, um, what do we do about the plan of care if they're not if we're not going to have a face to face encounter done until after the episode has already begun? And the answer is, um, technically, your plan of care is not complete 
until you have certified that a face-to-face -face encounter has occurred. So you would not be able to do the face the actual plan of care and get it finalized until the face-to-face -face encounter has occurred. So you should be obtaining always um, verbal approval of any treatment that you're going to provide to a patient from a physician um, prior to receiving his signature on the plan of care. If you're treating patients without getting verbal approval or some type of approval of the plan of care, you're treating the patient with your own care plan, not with the physician's care plan. So you want to make sure you do that. Um, the next question is, can you clarify the steps that need to be taken to change the focus of care for the second 30-day period um, of the same episode? Um, do we just need an MD order? The answer is, yes, you need an MD order um, to basically just state that you're updating the primary focus of home care uh, for the coming billing period. And then um, in your software system, you're going to have to address um, with your software vendor um, exactly, um, exactly how you are going to um, do that. You need to talk to your software vendor about exactly where to put the new code so that it actually pulls um, to your claim. Um, I was just told that the link um, for the chat is not actually in the chat, and that's because me or Robbie didn't post it in the chat, so I'm going to do that now. Um, okay, so now in the chat from me, you should see the link um, to the handouts. I just sent it. Um, let's see. Okay, I think that's it, except for specific diagnosis coding questions, which again, um, we do have copied and we'll get those responses out in the form of email to everyone. Um, and with the recorded webinar, all the Q&A that we've done on the webinar um, will be a part of that recording as well. Um, so thank you all again uh, for participating today. Um, we are um, very appreciative of your attendance. If there's ever anything that Healthcare Provider Solutions can do for you, please don't hesitate um, to reach out for us, um, including um, coding for you. So thank you all again. Have a fabulous week and uh, let us know if we can help in any way.